John chapter 16 is where we are in our text today. If you brought your Bible, please take it and turn with me there. Uh, Really focusing in at verse 31, picking up where we left off last time. But I'm going to start the reading this morning in verse 25. So to go back and pick it up and finish the reading and, um, and then step into the middle of it where we left off. So you're getting your Bibles open. I'm getting mine open. And I want to tell you a story. So somebody asked me not too long ago, um, when we were buying all these new chairs and stuff, why, why, why didn't we get one up here for you to sit in? And um, there's a reason. There's a reason not to do that. And it goes back into church history. So today's Reformation Day, so we're going to have a Reformation moment. And um, let me begin by saying there's nothing in the Bible about any of that. And there's no instruction about a right or wrong. So we just, we look back at history and we try to learn or when we fall in love with a particular aspect of our tradition, we copy it and pray that God will be honored in our best endeavor, right? Y'all, y'all know that's, um, that's the context for Luther's um, most famous, I think it's the thing he's quoted about more than any other, is uh, sin boldly, rejoicing in Christ always. Y'all ever heard that? You aren't smiling at me. You're taking this way too seriously. So we haven't read the Bible yet. Relax. I told you, I'm telling you a story. We're doing Reformation Day for a minute. All right. How many of you have heard that quote before today? All right. That's about half of you. Not nearly enough. Y'all got to read more. Okay. So he said this. Bear with me. He was probably several beers down, having fun with his students. <clears throat> Y'all know that, right? Okay. All right. Whew, I don't want to shock anybody today with that information, but uh, that's Luther. His wife was a home brewer, and uh, they delighted in this. I mean, you couldn't go down to the local store, and so that's, that's the way things were in the 1500s. But there was a context to that. You can't just quote, you can't just say, sin boldly, rejoice in Christ always. That's not a mantra to live by. Out of context, folks. Okay, That's antinomian. You know, you'd be like, you don't understand the gospel of grace and the change it makes in our life. And it's not the context. But there are some really tough situations we find ourselves in. And this is, I know it's too many, too many clarifications, but we'll get there. Hold, bear with me. So situational ethics, you've heard that phrase before, right? Like, that's, that's not a license to just do whatever you want. And so Luther knew this. But there are some times you'll be put in a situation where you just don't know what is the right. There's a couple of right things to do, but there's something messed up about both of the options or all three of the options. And it was in that context that he said, you're going to have to sin boldly and rejoice. You're going to have to do something. You can't you can't afford to do nothing. And and so you're going to have to trust in faith, trust Christ that your attempt to do right in this moment is all you can do, and trust Christ in the midst of that. Whew. All right. So there's a little known um, there's a little known aspect to our tradition, and it's um, that when we do worship, we try to do worship according to the Word of God. We got a fancy Puritan name for it called the regulative principle. All right. How many of you have heard of that? Say more of you. Y'all need to read more because if you know that and you don't know Luther, you're missing all the juicy stuff from the Reformation. All right. All right. So regular principle. And this is true. This is what we try to do. We try to say, OK, these are the things prescribed to do in the Bible for us in worship. But if you have studied the Bible long enough to know, you know, there are things, dare I say it, even as Presbyterians that we do in worship that you cannot nece- you will not necessarily find a direction, a direct command to do it that way. Right. All right. I've said enough. So we don't have a chair up here for the bishop to sit in. Right. So a chair, a chair, a large chair, particularly a chair on the platform, on the chancel, if you will, um, if you prefer, um, was the bishop's throne. He sat and presided over. And so in Geneva, when St. Peter's was, um, was became a reformed church and Calvin was the pastor, it was his practice to sit with the congregation. 
It's like, you may wonder, Pastor, why do you sit on the front row? Why do you sit with us? You have to come up and go back and come up. Why don't you just get a chair and sit up there and stay? Uh, it's because that's, that's what Calvin did. Calvin sat with the people. He sang with the I would rather sit down. We try to lead worship, though. I'd rather sit with you and sing because that's our life together. We worship God together. We sing together. And if you know, if you know this, maybe it will, in, if, by me sharing this, if you come to understand this, Maybe it will enrich our walk together. And Reformation moment comes to a close. Gospel of John, chapter 16, uh, starting at verse 25. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name... And I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I am from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. His disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figures of speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. For this morning, Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered each to his own home and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace in the world. You may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word, for the growth of his people, and the glory of his name. So, this is a, this is a, this is a context, it is a section, and you can tell that because it's, Organized. Verse 25, the hour is coming. Verse 32, the hour is coming. And so that's, that's the nature of the, of the outline, if you will, the section and why we have dealt with it in sections because there was just so much that he had to say about this hour that was coming. Verse 25 through 30, and we actually all the way to 31 last time. But we're going to go back and pick up verse 31 this morning because when he asks that question, I don't think this is a sincere question. I think uh, I do not attribute sarcasm to Jesus. I know there's, there's times when, when, when there's a kind of a popular way of talking about sarcasm that we can attribute. He has these sharp, witty responses to people at times. Uh, but sarcasm is a kind of veiled anger. And, and even though Jesus is being witty and he is cutting people off at the knees at times, I don't want to attribute sarcasm to him. Uh, but it looks a little bit like that. This is a, this is a confrontation. Do you believe now? Because he's telling them, you just think you believe. You have no idea. Right? And that's why this is important. The hour is coming. Right? Pay attention to what I'm about to say. The hour is coming. You know, and he, and I will no longer speak to you. And you know, there will be clarity. The puzzles will be made plain. Remember that from last week? And... Uh, and then this, this grace that comes from the, from the clarity and this authenticity of, of his love, the, the, the atonement, how he has come to die for us and, and make this possible. Uh, they're on the other side of all that, pre-resurrection. And so the light, the illumination necessary to understand and be faithful, it's not yet come. As I said, we believe. Do you? And so we pick it up. Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come. You're going to be scattered, each to his own home. And you're going to leave me. You're going to abandon me. Yet the Father will not. And I've said these things to you, right? So that you're going to remember. The Spirit's going to use it. He's going to draw that out of your memory on the other side of the resurrection. I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. You can remember these words. Through the hardship you're about to go through. Because in the world, you're going to have tribulation. You're going to have trouble. You're going to have trial. 
You're about to be scattered, and it is going to challenge you in ways you've not been challenged yet. But then the encouragement to close the section before he begins his high priestly prayer. Take heart. I have overcome the world. Well, that's it in a nutshell. If you've got your uh, bulletin open to that clean page for note taking and you want to see the outline, I've got five words for you and I'll try to give them to you slowly enough. You can write them down with some space in between if you want to do that. We've got five words. I'm going to give them to you. I'll give them to you quickly so you can see and then I'll go back and repeat them more slowly. Okay. We're going to look at the nature of we're going to look at faith. We're going to look at comfort, memory, peace. And victory. These are some of the key concepts in the unfolding of these few verses. This is probably one of the um, not normal sermons for me because this is just three verse 31, 32, and 33. But we've got five different things here. Faith, it will be tested. Comfort, it will be given. Memory, it's necessary. Peace. It can be discovered. Victory. It will be established. Faith, comfort, memory, peace, and victory. Let's look at the first one. Faith will be tested. He says, Behold, an hour is coming. Indeed, it is. It has come. It's upon them. It's here. When you will be scattered. There's a tribulation coming. There's trial coming. And it will be a sanctifying moment. It's going to put you to the test. Everything you say you value will be challenged. How many of you have somebody in your life that when you go through a hard moment, they're always there to give you a, a Bible word to help you get through your trouble? How many of you have been gifted with such a saint in your life? Are there? Don't raise your hand on this one. Um, are, there, are there times that you just love that person and times that you just hate that person? You know, those are sanctifying moments when we get challenged. Um, my wife has a, has a special way of reminding me that when uh, I am faced with a, a, a challenge to my character, that God has ordained this moment for my sanctification. Well, we had this conversation, report cards came out this week at home, and we had this conversation even this very morning around the table. Um, it's a growth moment, right? There's all kinds of growth moments in our lives. For many of you, traffic is a growth moment. You are challenged every time you get into your car. It's like your personality changes. You enter the personality change chamber, and you become a different person. The anonymity of being behind the wheel is kind of like the anonymity you experience behind your keyboard at home and your own Facebook. And you become a different person. Uh, you should be praying that God would give you grace and strength not to devolve into that human. And that's what it's all about. And that's what the challenge here is. These guys think they believe. They, at every point, they think they're growing, they're making progress. Um, and Jesus is always reminding them, not yet. The atoning death of Christ has not occurred yet. The power of the resurrection, that redemptive historical moment that changes everything has not happened yet. The pouring out of the Holy Spirit has not come yet. And so you don't, you don't get it yet, guys. But remember, remember my words. It's going to be important. Sanctifying moments. I, we also call them, needs should call them, shaping influences. Uh, everything around us is a shaping influence. Whether it's the movies that you watch, the recreations you participate in, um, where you shop, how you shop. Well, you don't believe that. I mean, those of you who still like to go to department stores, I mean, that is, that is, a, that is a, about to be a bygone cultural experience that you are still holding on to. You're like a keeper of the gate on that by going to a department store. And that, that has had a profound impact on our culture for many generations. Um, you can just look back and see that. The, the movement from mom and pop shops to big box stores now to big box websites. Uh, how, we, uh, how we participate in commerce is a shaping influence. Um, 
shaping influences around us that can be positive or they can be negative things. I've, I have started this point by pointing out those negative things. Like when we fail, when we are not doing well, when our attitude stinks, when we're being arrogant, prideful, haughty, like the disciples here are in this moment. Oh, now you're not speaking in figure. To, it's about time, Jesus. Now, don't miss that. That's the attitude. Ah, it's about time, Jesus. Now you're talking clearly. Now we can understand. Keep it up. You think you really believe now? So that's kind of a negative one. Out of their haughty, prideful, they get rebuked, they get corrected, and uh, they still need the Holy Spirit later before they're going to make sense out of it. But there can be positive uh, examples of this as well, such as you're here this morning, right? You are here. You have put yourself in a good place. You are sitting under the reading of God's Word, uh, an explanation of it in a much broader context. You know, we're kind of looking at it in a multitude of ways. And this is a shaping moment. It's a growth moment. And our hope is, is that we'll be able to see this truth by looking at this moment um, at the end of Christ's ministry and the lives of the disciples. Hopefully we'll be able to look at it and learn about ourselves. We are here to obtain not just knowledge about God, but knowledge about ourselves. And those two forms of knowledge together work for our sanctification Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered. Why are they going to be scattered? They're going to be challenged in such a way. There's going to be such trauma in the arrest of Jesus that they are going to be scared to death. I had a moment like that in my childhood. Um, I was a young teenager, and some buddies of mine uh, came and got me on a four-wheeler and wanted to go do some things that they shouldn't have wanted to go do. I didn't know everything they had in mind. But I will never forget how scared I got when I got to where we were going. Some of them were already there, and so were the police. And we pulled up, and um, I was shaking. You know, I am 13 years old um, with a healthy, uh, godlike fear of my father. And um, those blue lights were going, and all I wanted to do was run away. And when that police officer asked me, did I know those guys? And what was I doing there? I said, no, sir, I don't know them and I don't know what I'm doing here. He said, you can go home, I'll tell you. And I couldn't ride the four-wheeler back to the house and it was a long way. I have never run so fast in all my life. And I got home and I shut myself up in the house. I changed my clothes because I didn't want them to, to know who I was. I thought I would change my identity by changing my clothes. Because I knew they were coming to get me. And I knew later that evening they were going to find out where I live. And they were going to tell my dad. And that was going to be the end of me for sure. You've probably been there. You may not have been exactly that, to that extent. But you've been there where you've had that kind of fearful moment. Even more so. That's what these disciples have. That's just a, it's just a story out of my life to hopefully illustrate the depth of fear that these men would feel when they would be scattered all back to their homes. Their hopes for the raising of an army to defeat Rome would be dashed. Their hopes for a place of glory in the coming kingdom of Israel, dashed. And all they could do was run away. They're being tested. Faith, their faith in Christ, their understanding of His words being tested in this moment. And in the doing so... Um, Sovereign hand of God orchestrating these events. And in this moment of doing so, they're going to be shaped in such a way that later when the Holy Spirit comes and empowers them, they will not turn back. This is a lesson. This is a moment of learning for them. I have some of those too. Most of them about pastoral ministry. I look back on mistakes I've made. Attitude. Um, things said. Um, passionate about certain things. And I think now, you know, there was a better way. There's a better way to do those things. And I, and I hope, and I hope 20 years later, I hope I'm a, a better pastor than I was in those days. But that's really, you know, and you, and you need to do that too. That kind of heart searching this morning about yourself. Look back on those life lessons, those growth moments. That's what it's all about, is becoming more like Jesus. It's what he died for. It's why he went to the cross. Our sins would be forgiven. But so then too, we might have the grace to become more like him. That's what we see here in that moment, faith tested. Notice the comfort, though. It, it comes to Christ first. He says, you're going to leave me, but the Father will not. It's in that transition. You're going to be scattered to your own home, and you will leave me alone. 
That is a significant phrase because they didn't believe that. They, they thought they had a sold out devotion to him. I mean, Jesus, Jesus was, in a sense, their dearest friend. He was their leader. They looked to him really for everything to teach them, instruct them. He was their mentor. He was their leader. And in their best moments, their Lord, their master, not just teacher, but one to whom they would be willing to bow. He says, you're going to leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. If you know the story as it's told in Matthew and Mark and Luke, you know that when Jesus is on the cross, in that moment where uh, in, the, in, the, in the line of 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 20, verse 21, He who knew no sin became sin for us, right, that we might become the righteousness of God. He who knew no sin became sin for us. And in that moment on the cross, Matthew 27 unfolds this. He's there on the cross, and we, we get to see that moment. It's not explained to us, but we get to see that moment that's explained in the Corinthian passage. And he cries out, my God, my God. He's singing the lament of Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We call it the cry of dereliction, the cry of desperation, the cry of abandonment, right? The Father who is holy, so holy as not to look on sin, in some sense, has turned His back on the Son as the Son receives the sins of Christ's people. And He pays the atoning price for those sins. You might say, you might, you might look, how do these things fit together? Disciples leave me, but the Father won't. But what about the cry of abandonment? You have to go back to last week's sermon and remember how I set you up for this to remind you that the act of atonement, that work, that in, it's an English word, that, and it's very important. NASB holds on to it. ESV, the translations, New American Standard, English Standard. Those two translations, they work to hold on to this really great word, propitiation. I don't mind the way the NIV translates it. It's just, it's just an expanded. You, got, you still need propitiation. A sacrifice of atonement that appeases the wrath of God. NIV doesn't give you the second phrase, just the first. A sacrifice of atonement. Propitiation is a sacrifice of atonement that appeases the wrath of God. And you have to understand that not just in the light that Paul teaches it to us, a la Romans 3, but the light that John teaches teaches it to us in 1 John 4, 9 and 10. See, in Romans, when Paul teaches us about propitiation, and these are the only two places you get it, right? when Paul teaches about propitiation, it's with the emphasis on the judicial aspects, the law aspects, why he's dying, to appease the judicial wrath of God. But in John's work with the same word, he uses it to describe the heart of love that provides it. And it takes both Paul and John to get the biblical perspective. Because yes, he's the propitiation. Yes, the wrath of God is present in that deed at the cross. But this isn't the son working in opposition to the father to reconcile him in some way. This is the eternal plan of the Father and the Son together to carry out what had been decreed from eternity. The salvation, the redemption, the rescue of a bride for the Son. And Jesus knows that even though He will endure this great hardship, He is comforted by the reality that in some sense, the Father will be with Him and not abandon Him completely. It's the only way He will get through it. It's the right way to understand it. From it, we get to know that we too get to have comfort. If Christ is comforted, we're comforted. That's why he says, verse 33, I have said these things to you, that in me you, you may have peace. So we finish the point on comfort. It's Christ's comfort, but like he was comforted, we too receive comfort. We'll, get to, we'll say more about peace in just a second, but just delight in that. Look at the context here. These disciples are about to be scattered. They're about to have trial and tribulation beyond their ability to bear it. 
But God is going to provide grace for them to be able to stand up under the temptation and be rescued from it. You too are the blessed recipient. Because this is why Jesus died. It's why he was raised again. To give us hope and to give us comfort in the midst of our own trials. It's a shaping moment. What you're hearing right now, it's a growth moment. It's a shaping moment. Let me make further application. I said this last Sunday, but it bears repeating. When you are really challenged, I mean those kinds of challenges in life that cause anxiety in the deepest place of your being, and you worry, you turn it over again and again and again. All right? How many of you know what I'm talking about? Is anybody, is anybody in here with me? You know, like some of you are so strong, you never do this. But for the rest of us, there are times when we have a problem that's so big, we sit in our chair at home, and when somebody comes up to you and says, hey, what is wrong? I don't want to talk about it. Leave me alone. I'm not done dealing with this yet. In fact, in a strange way, you're receiving comfort. Isn't that weird? In a strange way, you're receiving comfort by turning that thing over and over. Like you think in a minute, I'm going to solve this. In a minute, it's going to come to me, and I'm going to, and I'm going to be able to get it. But you need to remember, you got the tiger by the tail, and it's just as dangerous to keep holding on as it is to let go. But you'll be much better off to let go. That's why in John 16, there's so much about praying. Have you noticed that? How we just keep coming back to that? Right? So instead of turning it over in your own brain and having the anxiety churn, comfort comes. The comfort that Christ himself has comes when we open our mouth to speak it to God. And if you open to chapter 17, if you go ahead and flip and get a preview of what's coming next week, that's exactly what it is. You think Matthew 6, 9 through 13 is the Lord's Prayer. But it's really not. It's the model prayer that he gives to us to help us outline prayers. The Lord's Prayer is in the next chapter. At that moment of his deepest anxiety, when he's even sweating drops of blood because it's coming out of every pore, what's he doing? In Gethsemane, praying. Here, in John 17, see him praying. Comfort, it comes from him. And the blessed three, memory. Um, I love this point because so many of you have been uh, so delightful in telling me about how you are getting older and you forget things. Forgetting things is not, it's not the um, peculiar commonplace of getting older. Every human being suffers from forgetting stuff. And you think, but I didn't used to forget as many things as I forget now. But you also... Let me encourage you. Think about this with me. You also get the blessed, really great experience of remembering a boat ton of stuff. Like this seems to be way back. Like when we start singing a hymn, and you don't even need the hymn book. Oh, come on now. Nod. Yeah. Like I, might, I might not be able to remember my address, but I can sing. How firm a foundation. And you, you're like, I hope somebody will see me. You're like, I'll oh, close the book. I'm so sad. You know, I don't need the book. Memory. It's there. It's embedded in us. How many of you need help reciting the first question and answer of the Westminster Shorter Catechism? You memorized it so long ago, you can say it. Um, how many of you need help memorize, you know, remembering John 3.16? How many of you need help uh, remembering? You might, not, you might not always remember exactly where it is. But you don't need any help remembering that text of Scripture. Memory is a great gift. And it's, and it's this gift that leads to mercy and peace. But not just the content of songs and Bible passages. Even more importantly, and let me encourage you again. If you're one of those people here today and you're saying, I'm struggling to remember. That's, that's me. I'm having trouble remembering stuff. It was a joke. This I, Thursday and Friday, I was away at a conference. Actually, Saturday, too. We got back late yesterday. Um, Dan and Lori and I went to a, a conference for a classical learning for our school. Uh, part I went to was more like a pastor's retreat. Um, it was fantastic. It came back mind-popping. But uh, 
I told him there that I was a um, pastor of this church and in some sense the head of the school next door too. And a guy said, well, that's awesome or you're really crazy or you fell on your head. <laughs> and I said, well, actually I did. Uh, at age 37, I fell, hit the back of my head and I have the bump to prove it still. I had the doctor look at it not too long ago. He said, it's fine. It's just a calcium growth on the back where you obviously smacked your skull at some point in the past. He says, but you're okay. But I will tell you from, from that event until about four or five years ago, three, three, four years ago, that was a lot of years. That was a decade. I struggled. Like, like my personality changed. I got more. It was a concussion. I mean, it was, this, it was the real deal. I had this new profound anxiety I was dealing with and it took a long time to get better. My family will tell you I ain't fixed yet. But, <laughs> but there are three things that I remember, even through all of that, that have given me hope and comfort and peace through it all. And I want to share those three things with you this morning. And it begins by remembering who God is. And I hope you have no trouble remembering that. Because this is the memory that leads to the mercy of peace. God is the sovereign creator over all the universe. He is king of the universe. He does all his holy will. He will accomplish what he pleases. No one can thwart his plan. He is amazing. He is awesome. He is glorious. He is grand. He can be trusted. Do you remember that? And remember what Christ has done. Like, like eggheads, they get, into, they get into really thinking hard about these arguments for the existence of God. And I, I'm an egghead too, and I love them. But you can't prove, like, like you can sort of logically prove the existence of a God, but you can't prove the existence of the Christian God. And I heard somebody ask um, William Lane Craig this question, why does he believe in the Christian God when the theistic proofs don't prove who, you know, the existence of that God, just maybe the theory of a, any God. He says, well, you're right, that is true. But you start there. There is a God. And then you look to Jesus, who he claims to be, what happened, the historicity of it, and it just sort of emerges, this is the truth. So we remember what he's done. We remember, we remember his sinless living on our behalf. We remember his substitutionary death on our behalf. He took the punishment we deserved. We remember his victorious resurrection. I'm not at the fifth point yet, but that's the one. All right? We remember how he did all of these things on our behalf. And then we get to remember who we are, finally. And this work applied to our lives is the restoration of our natures. The restoration of what God gave in the garden. When things aren't going well, tell yourself, I am not home yet. God is still God. Jesus still is my Redeemer. He really did all that stuff. And I'm being... Listen, being, get the grammar of that. I am being restored. I'm not fully restored yet. But I am his and he is mine. John 10, 28, no one can snatch me out of his hand. And from that is this gift of peace. It's there to be discovered. I have said these things to you that in me, I have said these things to you, that's the memory, that in me you may have peace. I want you to notice this. I don't have a lot to say about this because I've already said so much about it already. But I want you to note this distinction between praying and thinking. Right? That's the two things you do. You will pray and you will think. You will worry and have anxiety and you will pray. And there's a distinction to be made when you're doing those two activities. That peace is the removal of the lions when in actuality it is not that they be removed but that their mouths be shut. There's one thing I see in the gospel with regard to his disciples and how the gospel is then passed on to the next generation is the joy and the peace, the life that God gives to us through Jesus. 
it's, it's not a joy by way of the removal of sorrow. It's joy in the midst of sorrow. It's the mingling of pain with eyes fixed on Christ. It's, it's not peace by the removal of trial. It's being in the midst of the trial and having the memory to remember who God is and what He's done and who I am in the midst of this. And so it's not that the lions would be taken out of the den, but rather that the grace and the power of the hand of God would close their mouths. You know, it's still a frightening thing to be in the den with the lions, though their mouths be shut. Finally, the victory uh, to be established. What encouragement. He says, take heart. I'm so glad that Jesus knows how to talk to us. We make mistakes. We say dumb things all the time to one another. If somebody in this church ever says something dumb to you, just pray for them. Don't get mad at them. People will do that. People will say things to you and you'll be like, where in the world did that come from? It's okay. It really is. Be thankful. Jesus knows how to speak to us. So where that came from is I was listening to a guy this weekend. Um, I don't know, Thursday and Friday just turned into a weekend for me. It's okay. Um, so this week I was listening to this guy, and he was talking about a parenting seminar he got subjected to. It was probably really great, um, but there was, he's got a child that's very difficult in a variety of ways. His testimony was that his daughter um, unex inexplicably cries herself to sleep every night. This is dealing with uh, significant issues in her heart. And they'd gone to this parenting conference, and the conference speaker had said, we need tougher children. We need, to, we need them to buck up and get strong. And that hit him. That hit him horribly wrong. Because he didn't really know how to minister to his child, and he didn't think going home and telling her to, uh, to get tough, to toughen up, be strong, uh, turn your heart to stone, and don't let the world get you down, would really help her. And he had been hopeful that the conference would provide some insight for his daughter. Jesus doesn't do that here. The phrase, take heart, does not mean get tough. It means look to the truths that have been spoken to you and find in them encouragement. And the big one is right there at the end. These go together. Take heart. Be encouraged. Don't lose hope. you got a long path between here and home. Don't get discouraged. I have overcome the world. He knows that. They need that. He knows that they need that because when they see him crucified, they are going to think it's all over and they are going to run and hide and they're going to be really tempted not to come back. But he tells them, be encouraged. I've already won. I've not even gone to the cross yet. And I've already won. It's been decreed to be so. Remember this. It's reality. It's a reality greater than the things you can touch with your hands or see with your eyes. My prayer this morning is, is that as you look at your life um, in relationship to our passage today, and you see the context of sorrow, hardship, trial, and tribulation, that you will be able to remember that God will grant you the grace to remember who God is. What Jesus has done. In doing so, see your identity in Him. And be deeply encouraged. And find grace and hope and comfort and peace and joy in the midst of the trial that surrounds you. It's why He died. It's why He's been raised again. This is the victory that He brings to us. And we look forward to getting to experience it fully and face-to-face -face with Him when we arrive safely home. Amen. Let's pray together. Great God in heaven, our almighty Father, infinite in all your ways and power and knowledge and goodness, grace and mercy and holiness. We bow just a moment just to pray. Take the word we've heard today and blend it, just knead it into our hearts, into our very souls to shape us and to change us. Let today 
uh, sitting under this word be a positive growth moment where we find some tools to deal better with the trials and sorrows and challenges around us. Grant us the grace of memory that we might have indeed the grace of peace and hope for your glory, for our good. Amen. Let's stand together and let's sing this morning our final song. It's a really a good way of wrapping all things up. The Reformation Hymn, as we affirm our conviction. Grace alone, faith alone, and Christ alone, and Scripture alone, God's glory alone. Let's sing these things by way of benediction and blessing.